Hi, I'm Gail Street. In 2006, Paths to the Present presented a series of episodes about Montgomery County's Great Road. That's Route 355 to us today. A lot of history happened along that major artery, and we want to rerun that series for you. Because the series is a few years old, some of the people interviewed have moved on to other positions. Also, in a few cases, the structures presented have been altered. But regardless, this series of shows gives you a sense of just how much history happened up and down this corridor. So, without further ado, let's follow again The Great Road. It's got different names depending on where you are. Wisconsin Avenue, Rockville Pike, Hungerford Drive, Frederick Road. We're talking about Route 355. Everyone knows it as a highly congested artery that frustrates most drivers and frightens many pedestrians. It's the most heavily traveled road in this county. And because of that, many go to great lengths to avoid it. From the very beginning, the road has been a landmark in Montgomery County. It got its start as a Native American trail, crisscrossing streams through woods and open spaces. Later, it came to be called the Great Road by the farmers who sent goods down to the port of Georgetown. Today, a drive up 355 reveals the extremes of urban, suburban, and rural landscapes. So sit back as Paths to the Present spends a year traveling the Great Road. I'm standing alongside Rockville Pike near Wooten Parkway. All around me are shopping centers, auto dealers, restaurants, and traffic. It's hard to picture the landscape in earlier days. Back then, the towns along the Great Road were tiny, with long stretches of farmland and woods in between. More than a century ago, the land you see here was part of the Dawson Farm. Over time, Rocky Glen, as it was called, grew to some 500 acres and stretched from the Pike west to Seven Locks Road. The farm's two homes have been preserved. The Gothic-style farmhouse dates to 1874. In 1913, the family built this prairie-influenced home. Back then, without all these buildings in the way, the front yard stretched all the way to the Pike. Adjacent to Rocky Glen on land originally owned by the Dawsons was the location of Montgomery County's first fairgrounds. Today it's the location of Richard Montgomery High School, but for nearly a century that spot drew farmers and city folk alike. The Montgomery County Agricultural Society organized in 1846, holding its first fair in September of that year. It was a place to learn about new techniques, the latest equipment, and to socialize. Over the years, the fair grew in size and appeal. A wooden grandstand was added for viewing events like harness racing and plowing contests. The Great Depression, as well as a ban on horse betting, caused the fair to fold in this location in 1932. Today, the spot where Veers Mill Road meets the Rockville Pike is known as the Mixing Bowl. It's a crossroads that goes back centuries. It's also one of the reasons why Rockville is here in the first place. To understand the city's roots, we enlisted the help of Eileen McGuckian, executive director of Peerless Rockville and the author of Rockville, Portrait of a City. We started our tour in the cemetery adjacent to St. Mary's Church. Well, Rockville is a crossroads community. That's what really got it started in the 1750s. The colonial settlers who came along here, uh, they started settling here in the 1750s, having their land grants, uh, bringing their slaves, uh, bringing what they needed to start their tobacco plantations, and uh, started the community. By the 1760s, there is a town or a village in the middle of this, and it's tiny, you have to imagine tiny. And people came 
of all the way from the tobacco farms way up in the northern part of uh, Frederick County. They came through what is now known as Rockville and they went on down to the tobacco ports, both in Georgetown, along the Great Road and along the Bladensburg Road to Bladensburg where the Anacostia River had the port there again taking their products to market. They also went to Great Falls from this center. They also went out to Monocacy in the upper western part of the county. And when the Port of Baltimore got started, they went to Baltimore. So where all these roads cross, the town of Rockville grew up, and this happened by the 1770s. Churches were a part of Rockville from the very beginning. St. Mary's Catholic Church was built in 1817 and is the oldest continuously operating church in Rockville. And along with the church came a cemetery. Some of these graves date to the 18th century. A more recent arrival is F. Scott Fitzgerald. Originally, he was laid to rest in the Rockville Cemetery off Baltimore Road. However, his remains were moved here in 1975 to be near his family. On the opposite corner, a new Richard Montgomery High School is being constructed. It will replace an already existing school. There's been a public school in Rockville since 1860, but the building used to be in a different place. The public school in Rockville was located at the corner of East Montgomery and Monroe Street, so in the center of town. And that was the elementary school, what we know today as a junior high or a middle school, and then as many grades as the public school system went up to, 10th grade, 11th grade, eventually 12th grade. Uh, every kid's dream in 1940, that school burns down. And so the high school specifically is looking for a new school. And in 1942, they ended up relocating on what had been the county fairgrounds. And that started in 1942, and there has been a Richard Montgomery High School on this site ever since. Today, this triangle of land between the Pike and Veers Mill is known as Veterans Park. But for most of the 20th century, Lewis and Edgar Reed operated their Dodge dealership here. Opened in 1915, Reed Brothers sold and serviced all sorts of cars and motorcycles. I'm home. Over a million Americans at risk of foreclosure have been helped by making home affordable. Find out now what your options I'm are. I'm home where I belong. You can never know which pool safety step will save a life. Until it does. No matter how safe you feel, adding multiple safety steps can mean the difference between a close call and a call to 911. Simple steps save lives. To learn some new ones, visit poolsafely.gov. Before Hungerford Drive was built in 1951 as a bypass, the Great Road followed a different route from what we know today. Just beyond St. Mary's Church, the road took a slight jog to the left. It passed through what today is the Judicial Center, running up to North Washington Street before continuing on to Frederick. If you had come to this spot, uh, say, 100 years ago or 50 years ago, you would have seen something very different. Uh, Rockville is a small town at that point, fewer than 2,000 people, and all around is farmland. If you walk a mile in any direction, you are out of town. So this is a market center. It's the center of local government. So in the courthouse behind me is where you would have done your court business. It's where you would have seen the county commissioners or the school board. Uh, there was a public park in front of it, a triangular park that held the most important things in Rockville. The town clock, the Confederate statue, the water fountain, the weather reading station. So those were the important things, but that was Rockville's only public park. And on the diagonal, right alongside the courthouse, ran the Great Road. This was Rockville's main street. On it was everything that made up the fabric of a small town. Churches, stores, restaurants, a movie theater, residences, and offices for people who had businesses in town. When Montgomery County was formed in 1776, Rockville was chosen as the county seat because of its central location and accessibility. The red brick courthouse was built in 1891. Then all the county functions were held under one roof. It's the third courthouse to be constructed on this site. 
Right next door is the Gray Courthouse. Dating to 1931, this neoclassical style building was added to accommodate a post-World War I expanding population. Across the street is Rockville's only surviving Art Deco building. Still used as a bank today, Farmers Banking and Trust was constructed in 1931. On the opposite corner is the Rockville Post Office. While postal service came to Rockville in 1794, this community did not have a permanent post office building until 1939. A block away at the corner of West Jefferson and North Washington Streets was once an important landmark. In the 18th century, this was the Great Road. Charles Hungerford began operating a tavern here in the 1760s. It was a place for people to stop, change horses, get something to drink, or spend the night. And there in 1774, patriots from this lower part of Frederick County decided that the people who lived in Boston had dumped the tea overboard because they were suffering in the common cause of America and it was time to start uniting as colonies in what eventually led to the American Revolution. As the 20th century progressed, Rockville's population continued to grow. By the 1950s, the popularity of the automobile had taken its toll on the city. Traffic jams and lack of parking caused people to shop elsewhere. They were drawn to neighborhood shopping centers that featured ample free parking. The businesses in the city started moving out. So along comes uh, the mayor and council at that point, and there's this new federal program that's available in the 1950s and it's called Urban Renewal. And Urban Renewal offers communities 90% of the costs of getting rid of the things they don't want here anymore and solving their problems and of building what they do want to have. So Rockville signed up as one of 800 communities throughout the, the country, signed up for Urban Re Renewal in the late 1950s and started doing the uh, destruction, the demolition of the old town center and the obliteration of the town streets. Um, in 1965. So by 1972, when the Rockville Mall opens, there is no semblance of the streetscape that you knew before that time. Rockville's urban renewal efforts brought the 15-story executive office building as well as the county's judicial center. The Rockville Mall was never a commercial success and the business district languished for many years. Now, 40 years later, the city is being transformed again. Successive mayors and councils have worked tirelessly to bring a workable redevelopment vision to fruition. By the end of 2006, Rockville will boast of a new library, a new town square, more commercial space, and housing. Continuing along the Great Road, we can still see where it took a slight jog at Washington Street and Bell Avenue. Along this route, one finds a longtime family-run business here in Rockville. We're standing in front of Snowden Funeral Home, which is one of many black businesses in Rockville. This one was started in 1926 and is on the old road from Georgetown up to Frederick. The black population of Rockville has been here as long as the white population. It was after the Civil War, after emancipation of blacks in Maryland in 1864, that the black population tended to live separately and segregation was the rule of Maryland. So you have black communities growing up within the larger town of Rockville. And one such community is the area around what is now Washington Street, Bell Avenue, Middle Lane, and now Hungerford Drive. There were churches, there were houses, they were everything from magnificent uh, houses, mansions almost, to slums. Uh, there were meeting halls, there were black businesses. Uh, this black school was there. And when a high school for black children finally came to Montgomery County, it was located there. A few blocks north, just before Hungerford Drive, there's a special neighborhood known as Haytai. The entrance is Martin's Lane, named for Samuel Martin, a free black man who owned this land in the early 1800s. Some of his descendants still live on this land today. Continuing on Hungerford Drive, we reach the county's Board of Education. It didn't start out to be an office building. We're standing in front of Carver High School and Junior College, which at the time of its use 
as that, 1951 to 1959, was the only high school for black students in Montgomery County. In fact, there was only ever one high school one building for black students in the county from 1927 until integration in 1961. But students came from all over the county to come to Carver. The students named it. There are wonderful old photographs of all the activities that went on here, and I think there was an awful lot of love in this building. Hey, Speedy, are gas prices getting to you? Drive the posted speed and improve mileage by 15% or more. It's like saving over 50 cents a gallon. Better mileage also means less emissions and smog. Now that's a green idea. You should never mix alcohol and driving. But have you heard about flex fuel cars? They run on E85, mostly ethanol with just 15% gasoline. Less imported oil, lower costs, and reductions in tailpipe and greenhouse gas emissions. Now that's a green idea. As we continue our trip northward along Route 355, we come to the Rockville campus of Montgomery College. This campus is one of three scattered throughout the county, providing higher education opportunities to a wide variety of students. Today, with an enrollment of over 15,000, the Rockville campus is the largest, but this is not where it all began. The 1946 Board of Education first envisioned a junior college for Montgomery County. The school opened that same year, sharing space with BCC High School. Two years later, their first commencement was held at Leland Junior High. Within four years of opening, Montgomery Junior College became fully accredited and it was time to find a campus of its own. In 1950, the Bliss Electrical School in Tacoma Park was purchased from Lewis Bliss. At the time of the sale, the college absorbed the Bliss program. In 1957, following the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board of Education decision, MJC opened its doors to black students. Until then, African Americans could attend junior college first at Lincoln High School, then at Carver. As the county's population increased and spread northward, plans were made to expand the college. In 1965, a partially completed Rockville campus opened its doors. It looked very sparse at the time, far different from its fully developed landscape of today. Thirteen years later, a third campus was opened in Germantown in order to serve the county's northern population. Today, 60,000 credit and non-credit students are served by MC, which is rated as one of the top community colleges in the nation. The next stop on our tour northward is King Farm. Most people are familiar with the housing development, but before all the homes, shops, and restaurants were built, this land was a prominent dairy farm owned by the King family. This property was last owned by W. Lawson King. He purchased it in 1925 from the Graff family, who had owned it for nearly a century before that. King bought more property and expanded the farm to 300 acres. At one time, this was the largest dairy operation in the county. Today, five acres have been protected by the city of Rockville with an eye to using the buildings for an arts and history center. We met up with Robin Zeke, historic preservation planner for the city of Rockville at King Farm. She explains why this property is so important. I think the, the sense of how a farm operated is, is very clearly illustrated at this farm and, and is also one of the reasons why this is such an important property. Uh, in order to convey to all the people who really have never seen a farm, how a farm worked as a basically a private industry. And so the house is at one end facing the public road and providing a nice, beautiful public face. And then down the farm lane, as a spine, all of the farm buildings uh, address and, and face and, and operate off of that farm lane. There's the hay drying barn, tenant housing, and of course the dairy barn itself, which King had constructed in 1933. This one had two milking sheds separated by a courtyard. The weather vanes advertise King's triple A rating and one of the barns carries an ad for the company that distributed King's Milk. We have to say that this really is a 20th century dairy farm. 
and that the remnants of the early history uh, from 1822 is probably still underground, probably awaiting uh, archaeological investigations at some point, should anybody ever want to do that. But um, the graph history is, is basically preserved at this point in the public record and, and in documents. Crossing Shady Grove Road, we enter the city of Gaithersburg. Nowadays, it's hard to tell where Rockville ends and Gaithersburg begins. Judy Christensen is the historian for the Gaithersburg Community Museum. She explains that the landscape between Rockville and Gaithersburg used to be quite different. Well, basically, the road from Rockville to Gaithersburg was lined with widely spaced farms, and we didn't really reach any kind of village uh, until we reached um, Summit Avenue in Gaithersburg. The road itself was a two-lane dirt road, unpaved. It had some um, board planks laid across some of the ditches so people could cross the street. And that's about as good as it got. The Casey Community Center provides a colorful entree into Gaithersburg today. It's now a place where residents gather for special events, classes and meetings, but it too began as a farm. The property which now has the KC Community Center started out as a farm around 1800. The house was built in 1807 by the Magruder family. It was sold later to a man named Lemuel Clements, uh, and later after he sold it, he sold, his family sold it to Eugene B. Casey. And it was Casey that actually built this modern sanitary dairy barn in 1938. Uh, it housed, I think, 60 cows and produced 300 gallons of milk daily. But as that area began to develop around it into apartments and houses, um, dairying is not very um, compatible with uh, close residential use. So it basically turned into a NIH um, animal research laboratory. And Mr. Casey leased the barns and some of the property, about three acres, to NIH for a dollar a year. They had research animals uh, housed out there. And that was the prototype for their, their research, animal research station up in Poolsville. your GED diploma, the barriers in your life fall. Take the first step and get free GED information in your area at 1-877-38-YOUR-GED or yourged.org. Earn your GED diploma and begin your brighter future. Moving up the pike, we find a large park that today features a fitness center, a skate park, a miniature golf course, and an aquatic center. Looking back, this land is important in the history of Gaithersburg. Well, our earliest community in Gaithersburg was actually Logtown, and that was a subdivided parcel up right where uh, Boer Park and Summon Hall Farm are today. Uh, it was subdivided in the 1770s, was inhabited there for quite a while by about eight families, and there were half-acre lots and streets, and uh, there was actually some business. Uh, there was a tannery, a leather tannery, and uh, some uh, logging that went on there. Early Logtown resident John DeSellum expanded his land and platted Summit Hall Farm. And uh, the property was used as a general farm, and uh, they had uh, slaves. Uh, they also... Um, had a lot of outbuildings and uh, tenant houses, so it was almost like a little village. This account, written by De Selim in 1887, tells how Confederate soldiers camping on his land destroyed his fences and stole his livestock, equipment, and seed. 
It also describes how his quick-thinking sister managed not to lose everything. And the story, which is so wonderfully told in Mr. DeSalem's diary, is that his sister Sarah had their gold, their money. And knowing that these officers were Southern gentlemen would not lift up a lady's skirts, especially their hostess, she sewed the money into her petticoats. So they lost all of their farm equipment and all of their seed. I think they had one barrel of seed for the next winter to, to sow. Um, they managed to save the gold. The farmhouse that you see today is far different than the original. It looked similar to this structure when it was built in the early 1800s. A smokehouse was constructed next to it, which is still here today. Subsequent owner Ignatius Folks modernized the building soon after he bought it in 1886. The house was given a new facade that reflected the era's Victorian influence, but it didn't stay that way. In the 1930s, Frank and Nettie Wilmot had it remodeled again, this time with a Georgian touch. Their daughter Frances has lived here since 1947. She describes how the road in front of her house has changed. Originally, it was just a two-lane road. It was 240 originally, and then they changed it to 355, and, and then they put 270 in, and the more cars came, the more, the wider the road got, until you have what you have now, and more and more people came, and you, so you went from knowing almost everybody to not knowing hardly anybody <laughs> in town anymore. William Wilmot, Francis's brother, created Summit Hall Turf Farm, the first commercial sod farm in the country. The business just took off. The response from the uh, a very fortunate plug that he got on Arthur Godfrey's show in New York many, many years ago sort of ignited the interest throughout the country. And it, it did make a first class post office out of Gaithersburg from the, the mail that came in and the shipping and all, <laughs> it just skyrocketed. Summit Hall Farm is now owned by the city of Gaithersburg. However, Frances may live there for as long as she chooses. Officially, the site is now called Borer Park at Summit Hall Farm, named for Ed Borer, Jr., longtime mayor of Gaithersburg from 1986 to 1998. At the corner of Summit and Route 355, we find the Ascension Church, Completed in 1882, it's the city's oldest standing religious structure. The Summit Hotel once stood directly across the intersection. Opened in 1881, it was a popular summer destination. Diamond Avenue doesn't intersect 355 anymore. In 1930, a bridge was erected to prevent pedestrians from crossing the train tracks that paralleled the road. However, in the late 1700s, this spot was once home to Benjamin Gaither and his wife. They built their house there, we think, sometime in the 1790s. It was a log structure, just like most of the structures in Gaithersburg, probably a story and a half. And uh, Benjamin Gaither had an inn, he had a blacksmith shop, um, he had his business there. It also had the famous forest oak tree, which fell in 1997. And the forest oak tree, was determined to have been started as a seedling sometime 300 years ago, around 1700. It stood there for many, many years. It was considered a local landmark, was written up in history books, and in fact our town at one time was called Forest Oak because the post office was in the Forest Oak uh, store and post office, which was located under that tree. Most of Gaithersburg's early growth lined the two blocks of 355 north of Diamond Avenue. Few original buildings are still around. One that remains is Carson Ward's store. Today, it's a mattress discounters. Moving north is Grace Methodist Episcopal Church. Built in 1905, it was an offshoot of the Forest Oak Methodist Church, which is no longer standing, but its cemetery lives on. With the coming of the railroad, businesses shifted away from Route 355, and the area we know as Old Town today began to grow. But no one can deny that the city of Gaithersburg got its start because of its position along the Great Road. Well, that's all the time we have for this show. I'm Gail Street. I'll see you next time.